Bebari e beken Teneng kita upaya Mata ini lukna In the remaining jungle of Borneo lives a tribe of nomadic hunter-gatherers. They're known for their survival skills and for the deadly poison they use on their blowpipe darts. The Panan. Bala is a semi-nomadic Panan tribesman. He's recently had to take shelter in a village when his forest was cut down. He's using a bamboo segment as a container to fill with the deadly tajem, the poison applied to the tips of his hunting darts. The tajem tree, or Antiaris toxicaria, grows up to 40 meters high. It's widespread all over South Asia and tropical Africa. In its raw form, the sap is deadly when it enters the bloodstream, causing lethal cardiac arrhythmia. But through a special refining process, the Penan make it even more powerful. It is then fatal in less than two minutes, depending on the size of the prey. Bala carefully cleans the residual deadly sap from his machete. Bala pours the harvested latex into a pot made of dried leaves. He's careful to heat it at just the right distance from the flame to avoid boiling the sap. The darts are then coated in the poisonous mixture, dried by the fire, and are ready to use. Richard is a sedentary penan. He was born 10 years after his family was forced out of the jungle in the 90s. He works in a nearby national park. He's from one of the few villages that still has access to the untouched rainforest and reserve the right to practice traditional blowpipe hunting. They search for their favorite meat, the wild boar. It's become harder to find due to human activities around the border of the park. This squirrel got lucky. Richie has found some bamboo shoots. They'll provide a vegetarian meal for tonight. The rivers running through the national parks are clear and free of pollution from logging, which erodes the ground and makes the water muddy. The Penan can still practice fishing here. They use homemade spear guns. They also fish in swamps using bread. It only takes three seconds to catch a fish. Now it's my turn to try. A few Penan families still live as semi-nomads in the remote jungle. Langub, a sedentary Penan, guides me to meet them. Nice to meet you. We arrive at a camp built with the help of some sedentary Penan to facilitate meetings between the nomads and their relatives who have left the forest. Saya lives here a couple of months a year. Nice to meet you. With his two sons, Tion and Ajay, his wife and his two daughters. The Penan keep female names secret to outsiders, so they remain a mystery. For lunch, there's rice, turtle, and a mix of tapioca flour the Penan call naun, which tastes like water. Their main source of food would traditionally come from the sago palm tree. Saya and his kids are taking me to harvest its trunk. The Penan take great care not to damage the roots, so the palm will continue to thrive. The palm heart is typically made into a nutritious, non-perishable flour, but it's also eaten raw. In the few villages bordering reserved areas, the Penan have been offered jobs in the national parks and are allowed to hunt in untouched regions of rainforest. In tourist places like these, the government appears to have made an effort to build a brand new hospital 
But as I'll learn later, nothing has been arranged for the Penan who've been forced to settle down in remote villages. Nyapun was one of the first Penan chiefs to be forced to settle down. He says he's probably 89 years old. The Penan used to live in the present. The canopy would hide the sky so they couldn't count moon phases or years. The spear attached to the end of his blowpipe is a reliable secondary weapon. Tribal wars are still in living memory and encountering wild animals like giant pythons and sun bears could still be deadly. Nyapun's second wife plays nose flute. They live in this compound with their children and grandchildren. The older Penan folk suffer most from their lost nomadic lifestyle and struggle to adapt to life in the villages. Many suffer from depression or have lost their minds. I'm back with Bala. He shows me how to make Penan bark cloth. These were the traditional loincloths until cotton replaced them. This plant is used by the Penan to treat snake bites. It's one of the most useful medicinal plants in the jungle of Borneo, which is loaded with deadly snakes. <laughs> Like you hear the Bruno yes, before? Yeah. He used this one also. Okay. This same plant saved the life of Swiss ethnologist and activist Bruno Mansa. He spent six years living with the Penan in the 80s, unifying and rallying them against the loggers by helping them to block logging roads. The Malaysian government put a price on his head. He disappeared in the jungle of Sarawak in 2000 following his return from Europe. He was declared dead in 2005 and remains a hero for the Penan. It is time for me to leave the Penan. A people for whom kindness, generosity and courage is a way of life. Their ingenuity and the elegant solutions they employ to thrive in some of the most challenging and complex environments must not be lost. All of humanity could benefit from Penan knowledge of plants and their understanding of nature. One day, the tables will turn and the wealth of every country will be defined by the nature they hold. When that day comes, the last Penan families living in the wild may have left the rainforest along with all their secrets.